Solomini, a top 10 first crop sire in 2023, standing at McMahon of Saratoga. 14 first crop winners, including My Shady Lady, My winner Shady of the $500,000 New York Stallion Series Fifth Avenue Stakes, Grade 2 winner, Winstock, and, and win Stakes stock. winner, Solo Shot, Solomini the seventh leading freshman sire and the only top 10 freshman sire with a grade one or grade two winner. He sired a $700,000 two-year-old at the OBS April sale. His juveniles sold for nearly six figures on average, more than 12 times the stud fee. Solomini, a controversial DQ from being a grade one winner by two-time horse of the year, Curlin standing at McMahon of Saratoga Thoroughbreds. Thank you for visiting Pass the Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PassTheWire.com. You know, I was uh, caught up watching that Solomini commercial and uh, had a little production glitch. Didn't have my finger on the trigger for the intro, but nevertheless... We press on. Welcome in to, to Pass the Wire. Uh, I am Jim Gazzali, joined, as I always have been for the last couple of weeks, my brother, Kevin. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. We're so, due. What's that? We're due. Yeah, we are due. Uh, 0 for 2 the last couple of weeks on our uh, late pick 5 plays, bouncing around from, from track to track, seeing where... The big races are each weekend and, and trying to to work out our own sort of trip uh, through a late pick five sequence. And this week we're going to focus on Oaklawn Park. Uh, we've got the Rebel Stakes. Uh, we've got the Honeybee. We've got the Razorback, I believe. Uh, just a, a smattering of, of decent field sizes, decent field quality. Uh, so we'll see if we can string together a uh, nice little ticket here. Like you said, we've been uh, been 0 for 2 so far in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Though last week, we pretty much we were all around it last week in the uh, in the Risen Star. You nailed it with Sierra Leone. Uh, Catching Freedom was running late. Um, and uh, I forget the – I always want to say mis- mis- mischievousness, but that's not the horse's name. Uh <laughs> But we were all around it last week with the Risen Star, so uh, hopefully we can kind of keep it going uh, into this week. You know, it's funny, and we don't need to go too far into this. Normally, the horse that wins whatever prep race on the, over the weekend becomes the new it horse. We all sort of, you know, tend to have that recency bias, and. Sierra Leone closed in that Derby future pool at, at six to one, which you know, if we're being honest at this point, is probably a bad bet, but I feel like there's just been so much negativity around that horse. He was getting dragged on Twitter today. I guess the, the rag number came back and it was like a 13 and everyone was like, you know, basically saying that this horse sucks. And you know what? <laughs> exactly where I want to be. Keep, keep saying that this horse isn't going to going to get the roses on uh the first Saturday in May drive that price up let's go i'm still all in i thought that horse ran uh an incredible race and you know we'll see what he does in the bluegrass but you know keep that negativity flowing baby uh, i'm all in all in I, leon i will say as devil's advocate here knowing you a lot better uh, than some of the viewers behind the scenes. Last year, you were a very big fan of Kings Barnes. Same track, Louisiana Derby, though. Came back with a slow figure, and you kept saying, I don't care, Kings Barnes, baby. And then right around the right around the turn for home in the Derby, everyone else was kind of proven right. But I will say, uh, yes, I see it with Sierra Leone. It's, you kind of, it's, you know, uh, I, I kind of sometimes I get hung up to uh, like with horses that remind me of others. He reminds me a lot of Zandon, uh, just you know similar same connections, uh, pretty much similar running style. Um, 
Zandon never really ended up winning anything of super significance, but uh, but I'm with you. I mean, right now, yeah, there's really no one else. There's no other killers out there um, except Victory Avenue, but we could talk about that uh, at a later date as well. But uh, but yeah, let's let's get into it. Uh, I will say I had I did put that future bet in on Mage last year in like late January or early February. And, and that cashed pretty nicely. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to ride this Sierra Leone wave uh, as long <laughs> as take us and, you know, maybe a, maybe a triple crown up here at, at Saratoga in the Belmont. All right. Enough of that. Oaklawn Park, late pick five on, on Saturday. Kick it off in race eight. We landed on uh, a couple in here. Uh, I know we were both in, in pretty strong agreement on this one horse. Uh, what did you like about this one? Uh, mainly improving uh, improving speed figures. Um, and then the trainer switch back to Diodoro. This will be the second uh, after the switch. Um, if you look back at the end of last year, pretty much into 2022 as well, under when she was under Diodoro, uh, you know, she had really good speed figures that, that fit in here. Um, a lot of 90 plus figures, um, had to switch to a different trainer for one start and then came back to Diodoro already improved off of that one start, uh, at the end of last year. So I think getting a fast track here, hopefully, uh, you know, getting a little bit more time under Diodoro, a couple workouts, uh, can hopefully have her jump up into the nineties, which will, which will have her fit in here. Yeah. She has run some previous races that make her a, a strong contender and that returning to the barn angle, I do like, um, and, and that fast track, you know, seems to like Oaklawn, uh, five starts, two wins, one second. And, you know, one of the, the better recent um, figures uh, for for her. So uh, we were we were on the one, and we are also on the the three, and you know same same sort of thing. I feel like the the consistency of the late pace figures for me mm -hmm. or uh, the three. Let's be clear is is what. I I tended to to gravitate towards with this one and you know should be a fair price that we get as well. Yeah, uh obviously uh her first shot at Stakes Company last time out ran fourth uh but strong figures. Um hopefully something she can improve off of and I, I like that they got she ran on the third um got her out for a nice solid 48 for for a long workout. Um, on the 17th and then, you know, hopefully have her primed here for a, you know, third off or fourth off layoff uh, run here that, you know, and at eight to one, you know, if she can bounce up into the nineties, you know, she can with a pace tool, hopefully, you know, get some sort of pace tool up top and have her uh, come in late. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not unrealistic to think that, that this horse can take a step forward here and, and be a contender. Um, the other two, I know we were going to include the the seven mucho macho girl on our ticket. Uh, but the seven and eight figure to to take the most money. Uh, probably be a toss up between the two as to you know who will go favored here. Uh, but this mucho macho girl, you know, it's not a it's not really like a clever angle, I would say, but at least on the the Brisnets and you know really on the DRF too that that we're looking at here, um, she paired career bests, uh, eighty six buyer speed figure, ninety two Briz speed figures in her last two races. So you have to figure that this horse is once again going to move forward. Uh, the only hiccup, I guess, if you will, is you know, the trainer and, and the jockey, um, you know, Dallas Stewart mm -hmm. shipping in here, you know, not the greatest of shipping trainers and, and Brian Hernandez, great rider, 
um, just doesn't have a ton of, of mounts at, at Oaklawn uh, this meet. So, you know, I, I know Oaklawn can be a little finicky with how it's playing, and I just worry that perhaps a rider that doesn't have as much experience, uh, recent experience over this track, um, you know, might be at a, a bit of a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, basically looking at this, you have to kind of choose either to toss both the seven and the eight or pick one. Like you can't really, I mean, Grant is probably a, you know, not the best handicapping or wagering decision on our parts to include uh, the seven here with the other horses, but, um, you know, I think with just using three here, you can pretty much lock this race up and hopefully get on, move on to the next, next leg. But, uh, the decision making between seven or the eight to me, was just picking a horse that hasn't run as many races, um, and hoping and for about like a, a bump up, um, you know, you're just kind of projecting that she's going to make a, a bump up in, in form. Great workout. Like, super solid workouts running going into this race um, compared to the eight, which these could just be maintenance workouts, but they're not really super quick in my opinion. And she's run so much and it's been kind of even there in her three-year-old season. And then was kind of ran similar fig first race at four. I just don't see much improvement off of that nine last 91 last time out where the seven has this kind of room last run, you know, paired 92s and brisnet figures. Um, she could make a significant jump. Um, so that's why we kind of fell on the seven there. But yeah. like you said, Stuart Hernandez, it's not the best, but also I think it does create a little bit of value compared to picking a Gaffleone Aswison at Oaklawn. Like, I think, you know, that horse is going to be the clear number one choice. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that, that my, after the fact might make the ticket structure, you know, look a little bit more appealing, but um, you know, I think from a bet structure and betting theory standpoint, we can get away with including this at seven because, you know, just going off the morning lines here, the three is eight to one and the one is 10 to one. So, um, you know, and, and if we're projecting that this seven is going to be the second choice, then, you know, I think we're, we're trying to beat this eight. And we'll see. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it'll look a little bit better than, than it, it might right now. And not that it's something I really generally pay much attention to, but this the eight is carrying seven more pounds than, than most of the horses in here. Um, it's not really something I really pay attention to unless I feel like it makes me feel better about my decision. <laughs> uh, in this case, it does. So uh, that's just something to note, too. Is, so, um, you know, hopefully that can drag her down a little bit. Yeah. All right. On to uh, the honeybee and race nine. This is a a prep for the Kentucky Oaks. Again, I think we're both in in pretty solid agreement on this one horse, uh, Allie's Beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I just like the potential here. Uh, for a nice jump up after uh, after the layoff, you know, um, after the winter, getting into her three year old season. Um, not to say like I love Ta Tom Amos uh, as a LSU alumni, uh, <laughs> but he's such a high percentage trainer, but just seems to just not win these big races. Um, but I think this you know this horse definitely has a chance, and uh, the two solid favorites in here are, aren't killers by any stretch so i think you know this is definitely a 10 to 1 um and great solid workouts coming into this race i think it's definitely a, a horse that has a shot yeah uh we are also on the the three um honor cat uh again you know uh diodoro uh getting that that second start in in the barn uh, on the on the return trip to the barn, so we'll see what what sort of bump up we might be able to get um, get there. But again, you know, another another horse that that seems to like Oakland Park, mm -hmm. uh, a first and a second from two career starts there, um, you know, and, and should be 
in the mix early and figures to be a pretty decent price as well. Yeah, so a solid maiden win uh, last time out by five lengths. That's sometimes I can kind of make excuses for low late pace low uh, late pace figs um, and winning by five lengths. Pretty much the entire length of the stretch is one of those where uh, you would just assume that this horse isn't all out or um, uh, so. And that improvement off of the trainer switch um, plus gets a gets back on the work tab a couple times after after that win. Uh, hopefully, you know, this horse can make another jump and, you know, a solid price. Uh, the four, Neon Beach, another tandem for Asmussen and uh, Tyler Gaffleone. You know, just, again, a, an improving horse. I think I'd be probably be a bit surprised if we end up getting this eight to one. Uh, but, you know, a very nice showing, I thought, um, in in the last start, her first start as a three-year-old and certainly eligible to improve. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how the, the track comes up. But, uh, you know, I think this one, uh, certainly a a contender um and you know at least on the morning line that that eight to one uh, seems to be pretty enticing yeah i think you know a horse that at who already has a win at this distance is always a horse you, you kind of look to uh, especially aspas and gaffleon like you said um yeah it's just one of those things where we're, we're avoiding the top two favorites so um you got to make like basically you just got to make sure if you're tossing the two favorites, you, you want to pick the winner here. So um, I just think this horse has, has some potential to, to pop a, a decent number. And um, I mean, he's, she's already run uh, figures faster than uh, West Omaha's last time out. So, uh, you know, that shows that she at least has potential here. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we're, we're leaving, West Omaha off of our ticket. Um, you know, not that there's any real knocks on this horse, right? I mean, probably the most likely winner, but we're just looking to beat her, I guess. Yeah. And the, I mean, the question is like, she scratched out of the Phillies race at uh fairgrounds last week and then they decide to ship so like i just think that adds a little bit of haze to how confident they are in this horse maybe they're trying to avoid the muddy track um but it just seems to me like if you have a horse that you think can win i think you you would assume that she can win anywhere especially a horse who's who generally likes to run towards the front. So you would think that a muddy track really wouldn't be a deal breaker. Um, I, I think, you know, they didn't like her chances last week. This is just me assuming, obviously. So they kind of tried to chip her over here for less of a field. Cox has a bunch of horses running this day. Uh, to me, uh, that was a knock enough for me to kind of toss her. Yeah. 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 And it is uh, an interesting an interesting move for sure. Um, the other one that we are including is the eight and the, the 10. What did you like about both of these? So the, the 10, uh, mainly I, I like, he had huge, you know, his last or she, her last time out big figure on a fast track. So there's no real, like, you know, question there if a, if a horse comes with a huge fig on a muddy track, sometimes you can kind of raise an eyebrow and see, see if that's legit. Um, but so, uh, you know, horse is two for two coming from way outside. It's a late runner. So I'm not really concerned about the post at this point. Um, to me, it's just a good value horse with figures that are better than most of the horses in here. Um, and then the eight similar thing, just, you know, big figure last time out, uh, showed that she can get the distance. Um, it's kind of one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think that for the, the eight, you know, a, a decent showing 
um, figure wise on the Brisnet in her first start at three, which, you know, you want to, to see. And I think there's, there's room for improvement there. And, you know, when you're, you're trying to kind of looking at the speed figures and the, the pace figures, you know, this one definitely is worthy of consideration, um, especially at, at 10 to one. So, um, in this race nine, we're going one, three, four, eight, and 10. Uh, where am I here? Here we go. So race 10, the Razorback, this is always one of my, uh, I don't know if I'd call it my, one of my favorite races of the year, but it's always, uh, one that, that provides a, a fair amount of intrigue and full field. We settled on, on three horses here, the three, eight and 13. So let's hop in here with, uh, speed bias and what you liked about this one, Kev? Uh, this horse just seems to me like there's a pretty good chance this horse could wire the field. Um, great early pace showed, you know, going from my favorite thing here was uh, speed horse, great late pace figure shown he can hang on and we're cutting back from one a mile and an eighth to the mile 16. Um, I just think, you know, this horse at this number, um, can kind of get out there and run, set his own pace, and and hopefully uh, tell the other horses come and catch me. And um, he showed he can pretty much hang it at a mile and an eighth. Um, I think the cutback will serve him well. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree with that. Uh, the one that I really liked in here was the the eight uh, Magic Tap. Another. Uh, Asmussen, Gaffion, Tandem. Um, I'd imagine this this horse will probably go favored, um, but you know, again, just the you know running an improving line in in the last couple of of starts. And one thing that I, that I tend to look at, and kind of going off of your your last point is the the brisnet pace figures and just kind of seeing how a horse you know builds through a race you know almost kind of having that that sort of even distribution of of energy that we know is is important at these races oh you know over a mile and magic tap has shown that uh in consistently in his last three starts and you know i feel like He's run against tougher horses, and I think this is a, a good spot. And we'll see what kind of price we get. But you know, I, this would probably be one of my my better bets uh, of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt Cap in the tenth. Yeah, I, I I liked I liked him too. <laughs> I liked him too. Uh, there was just some others in here that I specific, specifically the. Uh, we went with the 13, but for me, it was really close between the 11 and the 13, uh, notary and, and Bolsey essentially just went with the 13 based off the assuming he's going to be a better price. Um, but we went, uh, yeah, we ended up going with Bolsey win at the track, win at this distance, going to be 15 to one Francisco Arrieta, a great race rider, uh, Super ton of experience at, o at Oakland. Great workouts uh, heading into this race as well. Um, the only thing, and I think he's going to be a good price because people get scared off this 13 post, but I have no facts to back this up, but I feel like the 12 and the 13 hole at Oakland just produce the amount, like way more winners than other tracks do from these holes. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's not really a knock on him. And, and he's a gun runner, so you know he's going to get the distance even from 13. Um. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, looking at the the Brisnet track bias stats here. Um, I guess I could just look at it, right? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, 
Porth is eight and wider, have a five percent. <laughs> like I said, purely anecdotal. Yeah. Just going based off my brain. <laughs> um so hey, it's 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 more than zero. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so we settled on the the three eight and and thirteen there, you know. But again, we also like that that eleven notary. I had that one highlighted on my sheet as well. Um, so if we we scared you off of the the thirteen um, with that that track stat, I don't know that the eleven is is much better. The other one in, that I was somewhat interested in here, but we ultimately left off was. The five octane, um, I liked that one uh, just a bit as well. So yeah, I, I agree. Uh, that was another one. But considering, I think he's going to be vying for favoritism in this race, and uh, just shipping in from Gulfstream, yeah, doesn't have a race over the track. It's kind of one of those things where you can kind of you know come up with excuses for him to, for him to not do well here. Yeah. Um, so, um, all right, the Rebel Derby prep. Uh, John did a preview Derby radar show uh, of this race, which is up on Pass the Wire TV right now. Uh, he went through all of the horses in the race. So go and check that out um, before you uh, make your bet tomorrow. Um, but we landed on uh, a couple here. 6, 9, 11, and 13. So let's, uh, let's start with, with the 6. I mean, it sounds like we're, we're thinking that Aspiusen and, and Gaff Leon are going to have a pretty big day. Yeah. Um, a horse coming off a win, good figures, close enough. Like, I mean, basically with this race, when you're looking at it, you have to decide whether you're going to – you think Timberlake is going to come in and run his race or – you're going to have to try and find horses that can put up a decent figure and run fast enough to win. We think Timberlake, first off the layoff, coming back, first race of the three-year-old season. Fun fact, Brad Cox has had the favorite in in the Rebel two of the last three years, and they haven't won. Verifying, and then uh, Cattle River in 21. <laughs> um, both didn't run well. Um Granted, those were their second races of their three-year-old season, so it's a little bit different, but uh, one of those things. And it also, when you're playing a pick five, you have to think 75% of the tickets are going to be running through Timberlake. Yeah. So if you can pick somebody who's going to win that's not Timberlake, you can really kind of boost your value of this ticket. So that's why, you know, you start looking elsewhere. And, yeah, di uh, Dimantic, Dimantic is, it was one of those top choices. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I think um, this horse is, is coming in off of a, a solid, solid last race. Uh, blinkers on, which, you know, like we talked about last week or the week before, is having an equipment change going into a big race is, um, you know, a bit surprising. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how – how that works out for them. Um, but, you know, certainly going to be a, a decent price for, you know, really solid um, connections. Uh, so we're, we're leaving Timberlake off, like we said, and then we're going to take a shot here too with this Laganos, uh, another Asmussen horse with uh, his son in the irons. Yes. Laganos, so I just – this horse was – had a, a very good two-year-old season, came into uh, the Smarty Jones in January, went off around three to one, a little bit under – a little bit over three to one, had Rosario up, and just didn't run a great race. I mean, first race of his three-year-old season, off a long layoff, but now the horse is all of a sudden 20-plus to one on the, on, the, on the morning line. I just think – this horse has the potential to kind of run back to his two-year-old form, which if Timberlake doesn't run his race, I think Loganos' two-year-old form is good enough to win this race. And like I was saying before, uh, 
the rebel likes to produce these large price winners. These early preps are, um, you know, kind of when these big prices will come in, especially at Oakland, Unoho confidence game last year. I, you know, I think this is a horse that has a shot to do something similar. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's, it's interesting too. He, he set pretty decent early fractions in this race and, you know, seemingly just got hired. And that was on new year's day, January 1st. Since then he's had one, two, three, four, five workouts, including two at five furlongs, which, you know, with this race being a mile and a 16th, like the Smarty Jones was, you have to figure that, that Asmussen is trying to, you know, put a little stamina into this horse. And to your point, you know, his last two races uh, in that allowance race at Churchill Downs in November, he went off uh, favored. And then in the Smarty Jones, he went off at, you know, about three and a half to one. And like you said, we're getting 20 to one here for, you know, not fading that terribly down the lane. He only lost by four and a half lengths after setting some pretty decent fractions. You know, you have to feel like with five workouts into him with a little bit more conditioning and we're looking at uh, what? Uh, 54 days off, almost two months off. He should be, be fit and ready to go. And at that price is definitely a contender, um, especially going up against a lot of horses that he's already faced. Yeah. Sorry. I was just looking it up because I was going to say the stat, but it turns out I was wrong. I could have sworn that Keith Asmussen was on super stock when he won the Arkansas Derby in 2021, but he was not. Um, yeah. But, so I was going to use that. I was going to say Keith Asmussen, he's won a big race at Oakland before, but not true. So, uh, but that's why I I just think, um, you know, good enough horse at a, at a great price. Yeah. Uh, the other one that we feel like has a, a decent shot in here is this Just Steel. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit of, Seconditis lately, as perhaps the the competition has stiffened a little bit, but again, you know, I'm not overly thrilled with this entire field. So perhaps this is the opportunity for Just Steel to break through and and get that victory. Yeah, I agree. It's it's one of those things where he feels Just Steel just feels like a horse where he's always going to be like second or third in a race like this. Someone who can't really get over the top and win. But in this field, you know, if you take Timberlake out, just Steele is, you know, the next most likely choice. Um, we saw him run a couple times at Saratoga last summer. He, he's a good horse. He has, like, you know, he has the potential to put together. And D. Wayne Lucas at Oaklawn feels like a good story if he wins this. Um, the only thing that scared me off is like seven to two. He's probably going to be like, you know, if you consider how big of a favorite Timberlake's going to be, like just steel is probably going to be like, you know, five to two or three to one, which is like pretty low for a horse like this. But to me, he feels like one of the most likely winners, uh, just by kind of process of elimination here. But sure. so one we're going to use, but you know, numbers wise and, you know, off odds, he's going to go off at some others in here i hope win over him but um he's good enough to win so so that's why we're using him yeah uh one of the ones we're hoping is good enough to win is this time for truth all the way on, on the outside uh for ron maquette uh at 15 to 1 what, what did you like about this one so uh yeah so 13 hole speed horse who appears at this point two races into his career needs the lead or at least enjoys the lead so not ideal coming from 13 especially with carbone at the, in the one hole who's going to be going for the lead northern flame is going to be going for the lead i just think um this horse being in omaha beach is going to like the added distance so i think 
at a route as opposed to a sprint. This horse is going to be more comfortable sitting second, third. So I think they're going to, they're not going to rush him up to try and get the lead. They're going to be sitting, you know, second or third kind of off the pace and hopefully can rate him and, and he can win. I mean, it's two races speed wise. They both figures fit. Um, so you're hoping, you know, third race, third career race, he can really make a jump into those mid nineties and, Basically, just kind of hope Timberlake doesn't run his race and time for truth is there when Carbone and uh, who was the other one? and Northern Flame start to kind of tire down the stretch. Yeah, and they're rushing this horse back a little quick. He's only going to be a two week turnaround. So, um, you know, you always wonder if that's a good sign or, or a bad sign that they're rushing him back for a derby prep. Um, you know, you wonder if if they think this horse is, is good enough or they're just, you know, making a, a last ditch effort to, to grab some points and, and perhaps get into the Derby starting gate. But um, you know, we'll see the, the post certainly doesn't help, but um, we haven't uh, let that deter us <laughs> from picking <laughs> our outside horses in this sequence so far. All right. In the, uh, the finale, a, a maiden special weight, kind of going along the the same sort of path of the, you know, zig when, when everybody zags, uh, kind of a wide open race here. These maidens can be a bit unpredictable, but we're going to go super narrow, super tight and single this seven crushed it for Brad Cox um, and, and see if we can, can get lucky here and, and hope that we get past Timberlake in the race prior to eliminate a lot of the competition and then perhaps single this seven crushed it when everybody else is spreading. Yeah. We essentially want Brad Cox to lose every race uh, until this one. <laughs> um, basically we were talking last night about it. It's one of those things. It was a huge maiden field, but it's just littered with, low not low percentage trainers in uh you know as a group but just low percentage with maidens um and the and the horses that have run previously in here just haven't run as fast as the seven has um so our hope is that while everyone's going to be spreading you see a what 12 12 to 13 horse field maiden field last leg everyone's going to be saying all right if i get to the last leg i want to make sure i have enough horses here to to cash um so that's why i think we kind of open up a little bit of value even though we're going to be favoring uh you know horses one to one on the morning line probably going to be three or four to five um but i just think his figures are so much better than every other horses every other horse that's had a start and the first time starters are under trainers that i don't think can really produce winners that are going to beat a Brad Cox horse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, you know, it, that horse should be the favorite, um, you know, another Asmussen and, and Gaffleone tandem on the, the two, give me a reason, but to your point, you know, in, in two start that for this two was never really close and hasn't run a figure uh, really anywhere close to, you know, at least looking on the Brisnet, uh, anywhere close to what Crushed It has run. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see what we can can muster, and you know, go super skinny in this last leg and and try and get lucky. Yeah, and I mean, in a, in a sequence like this, uh, we I always say that if we could just get if we get to the last race alive to the seven, then you know, it's all good from there. Yeah. Uh, so. All right. We'll, we'll take a quick timeout and we'll come back. We'll show our ticket and we'll go through it real quick one last time and then send everybody off on their way.
You want horsepower? We've got the sire power. Central Banker, New York's leading sire three years in a row, standing at McMahon of Saratoga. He has 12 black type winners, including multiple stakes winners and graded stakes placed, Banquet, Morning Matcha, and Bank Sting. Central Banker, sire of six figure yearlings and two year olds. He produced nine stakes runners in 2023. Runners have earned $20.5 million on the track. Central Banker, standing at McMahon of Saratoga Thoroughbreds. All right. Welcome back. Let's get the ticket up there. I wasn't sure. I feel like Oaklawn is maroon. I don't know why. I think because like <laughs> the facing of their uh, their clubhouse building there has has some maroon tint to it. So that's why uh, that's why I landed there. Yeah, <laughs> I picture more of a brown, but yeah, close enough. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we've got a, a $90 ticket here for a 50 cent bet. Race eight, we're going with the one, three, and seven. Uh, the one and the three there, the longer prices and the, the seven, all right, if I'm remembering that correctly, is, um, you know, we're hoping ends up being uh, the, you. the second choice there behind that that eight. Um and then in, in race nine, uh, spreading a pinch, we've got five horses included in there. Um, one, three, four, eight, and 10. And then in race 10, the Razorback, three, eight, and 13, hoping that our outside horse, Bolsey, can defy the odds of the outside post position and get us a nice victory at at double digit odds. Uh, so if and, the uh, sorry to cut you off, if the yeah. eight wins their magic tap, just everyone know that uh, Jim will be mf and me in text because he wanted to single the eight magic tap, and I did not agree. So just know that if he crosses the wire first. <laughs> Uh, in the 11th, the, the Rebel, again, check out John's analysis up on Pass the Wire TV uh, right now. Get a full breakdown of, of each horse in the starting gate for the Rebel. Uh, but we're trying to beat Timberlake. Uh, we feel like there's enough question marks coming back off of a long layoff, uh, shipping in uh, from, from Fairgrounds, I believe. Uh, it's probably where Cox has a lot of his horses. But – um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to beat him, um, and, and we'll see if we can, can get lucky and then we'll single the Cox horse in the finale, uh, crushed it, uh, just probably the most reliable horse in that race has run figures better than anybody else, uh, in that starting gate. But, you know, we've got five full fields, uh, some competitive fields, and, you know, we'll, hopefully we, we run into a big one here. Yeah, let's do what we're due. We are, we are due. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we missed the, I think our first one at, at Aqueduct, we went in an embarrassing, like, one or five, three. two yeah. five or something. Um, and then uh, we came back with, with another poor showing at Tampa. Uh, but hopefully Sierra Leone last week and, and being all around that exact mm -hmm. trifecta uh, at fairgrounds in the risen star was enough momentum to, to propel us to uh, a nice pick five score at Oakland park on Saturday. Yeah. Hopefully. Could, yeah. All we need is a little bit of confidence. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, good luck. If you're playing, we'll, Recap this next week and see how well we did. And uh, until then, good luck. Peace.
Nobody does it better.